This program was sponsored by the Jesse and John Dance Fund. Since 1962, these lectures have been a forum for distinguished scholars of national and international reputation who have concerned themselves with the impact of science and philosophy on man's perception of a rational universe. Good evening. I'm Janella Butler, Associate Dean of the Graduate School. I'm standing in tonight for Dean Marsha Landolt, who is out of town. We are here tonight because of a generous gift to the University of Washington. The Visiting Professorship Program was created in 1961 with a bequest from the estate of Mr. John Dance. Mr. Dance came to Seattle in the early 1900s and became a very successful businessman. He is perhaps best known for the chain of movie theaters he developed. John Dance was a self-educated man who read widely and liberally. He was fascinated by scientific developments and was particularly interested in the philosophy of humanism. In creating this endowment, his goal was to bring distinguished men and women who have concerned themselves with the impact of science and philosophy on man's perception of a rational universe to the University of Washington. Mr. Dance's wife, Jessie, shared this vision and augmented the endowment with additional gifts until the time of her death. Please now join me in expressing appreciation for this invaluable gift to the university and to the citizens of the region. Our speaker tonight, Vanessa Northington Gamble, will be introduced by Dr. Melissa Austin, who is both a professor of epidemiology in the School of Public Health and Community Medicine and the director of the Institute for Public Health Genetics. Professor Austin. Thank you very much. It's truly a pleasure to be here this evening to introduce Dr. Vanessa Northington Gamble to her dance lecture here at the University of Washington. I'd like to start by being sure to acknowledge the sponsors of Dr. Gamble's visit, including the Institute for Public Health Genetics, the Center for Ecogenetics and Environmental Health, the Schools of Law, Medicine, Nursing, Public Health and Community Medicine, and Pharmacy, and of course the Dan's family for creating the opportunity to invite such distinguished speakers such as Dr. Gamble here to the University of Washington. As many of you probably know, Dr. Gamble is an internationally recognized expert on the history of race and racism in America. She grew up in West Philadelphia and earned her BA in Medical Sociology and Human Biology at Hampshire College. She then received her MD and her PhD in the History and Sociology of Science from the University of Pennsylvania. She joined the faculty at the University of Wisconsin-Madison in 1989, where she became the first black woman tenured at the medical school there. She was director of the Center for the Study of Race and Ethnicity in Medicine and associate professor of the History of Medicine and Family Medicine at the University of Wisconsin. And she's currently president of the Division of Community and Minority Programs at the Association of American Medical Colleges. Among Dr. Gamble's many scholarly writings is her most recent work, Making a Place for Ourselves, the Black, Black Hospital Movement from 1920 to 1945. She has served as a consultant for numerous organizations, including the Alan Guttmacher Institute, the Agency for Healthcare Policy and Research, the Institute of Medicine, the National Institutes of Health, and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. She recently received a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Health Investigator Award to write a book of essays on race and racism in American medicine. But Dr. Gamble is perhaps best known for her role as chair of the Tuskegee Syphilis Study Legacy Committee that took the lead in the successful campaign to obtain a presidential apology for the syphilis study. For me, there are really three reasons why I'm especially pleased to introduce Dr. Gamble this evening. First, um, as you noted, I'm the director of our new Institute for Public Health Genetics here at the University of Washington, which is one of the first University Initiatives Fund programs that began in 1997. We're delighted that Dr. Gamble is the first lecturer that our relatively new program is able to sponsor. Second, in case you're not familiar with public health genetics, we're a multidisciplinary academic program that actually involves faculty from seven different schools and colleges here at the UW, many of whom are co-sponsors of her visit. In case you don't know what public health genetics is, we think of it as the application of advances in genomics and biotechnology to prevent disease and improve public health. <clears throat> 
One of the many components of our program is considering ethical, legal, and social implications, or as we call it, ELSI implications, of the Human Genome Project. And Dr. Gamble's work really epitomizes the type of debates and discussions that are urgently needed in applying genomics to public health. And finally, I think it's especially fitting that Dr. Gamble is visiting us during the week that we're celebrating Martin Luther King Jr. holiday. I'd like to end on a personal note, having been able to spend a, a little bit of time with Vanessa over the last couple of days, I've come to know that she's a connoisseur of Washington State oysters, and that she also knows her way around downtown Seattle better than anybody in the public health genetics program. <laughs> so I think to some extent we can, in a, in a small way, claim her as a Seattleite. So please join me in welcoming Vanessa Northington Gamble and her dance lecture entitled, It's Not Just Tuskegee, The History of African Americans and Medicine. Dr. Gamble. Thank you, Dr. Austin, and I want to thank the sponsors of the dance lecture for inviting me here this, uh, this uh, evening. And uh, in terms of, uh, in knowing Seattle, when I was at the University of Wisconsin, I once made a faux pas and I said, you know, I really enjoy being a, a faculty member at the University of Washington, when I meant to say <laughs> UW, uh, the other UW. So uh, I really am very happy uh, to, to be here this evening to talk about an issue that I think though, that is very important uh, to me and to those of you who are here in this audience. Tuskegee. Tuskegee, Tuskegee. When you hear this word, what pops in your mind? I think that for most of you, the word evokes images of the infamous Tuskegee syphilis study. It probably does not evoke images of Booker T. Washington, the founder of Tuskegee Institute, or of George Washington Carver, the scientists, or of the Tuskegee Airmen, the pioneering World War II aviation pioneers. Today, the word Tuskegee usually brings to mind the 40-year study conducted between 1932 and 1972 in which the United States Public Health Service deliberately denied 399 black men from Macon County, Alabama, effective treatment for syphilis in order to document the natural history of the disease, or to do, as the Public Health Service said, to follow the men to endpoint, meeting to autopsy. Now, in terms of the study, I just want to briefly give a brief history of the study. He said the study was in Macon County, Alabama. Annually, there were so-called roundups of the men. The men were followed for their health care to see what was the impact of syphilis on their lives. The men were diagnosed in terms of how, the, the, how syphilis had an impact on many of the organs of their bodies. There's cardiac exams. Blood samples were drawn to see what was the ravages of the syphilis in the men. And this slide, I think, is very powerful because, on the one hand, the men, this man is having his blood drawn. But other people interpret this slide as the man being given syphilis. And one of the myths of the syphilis study has been that the men were given syphilis. The men were not given syphilis. But it's, it's a myth that seems to be hard to take. The men were denied treatment for their syphilis. They were being told that they were being treated. For example, spinal taps, the families were told that they were back shots. So the men were deliberately denied treatment, and they were told that they were being treated for their syphilis. <laughs> All the men were in the late stages of the syphilis when the study began. Historian James Jones 
has called the Tuskegee syphilis study the longest non-therapeutic study in history. Published medical reports have estimated that between 28 to 100 men died as a result of their syphilis. The, first, the public first came to know about the syphilis study in July, tw on July 25th, 1972. These are some of the editorial ca cartoons that came out at the time that the syphilis study was first uh, brought to light. This is the, the, uh, a slide of the first public revelation of the syphilis study. And I always talk about the public revelation in terms of the syphilis study in that because it was known in the medical community. In the close to thir the 30 years that the story first broke, the study has moved from being a singular historical event to a powerful metaphor. Tuskegee has come to symbolize racism in medicine, misconduct in human research, the arrogance of physicians, and government abuse of black people. Tuskegee also represents a devastating wound for many black people. On May, 20, on May 16, 1970, 1997, President Clinton, in a very moving White House ceremony, apologized for the Tuskegee syphilis study. Actually, he apologized for the United States public health study at Tuskegee. An important corrective, I think, because it places responsibility for the study in the hands of the United States Public Health Service rather than those of Tuskegee Institute. Although facilities and staff of Tuskegee Institute were used in the study, primary direction for it came from the government under the auspices of the Public Health Service. At the White House ceremony, when President Clinton uttered the words, I am sorry. Tears streamed down the faces of many black people in the audience. Audible sobs could be heard. These tears vividly demonstrated that the pain inflicted by the syphilis study was not limited to the citizens of Macon County. For for many African Americans, the fact that the Tuskegee syphilis study occurred at all proves that black life is often not valued in America. The Tuskegee syphilis study is the most well-known episode in African-American medical history. In fact, this study was my very entry to a professional career that has focused on the history of race and racism in American medicine. In 1972, I remember sitting in the cafeteria of my college and reading about the syphilis study. I decided to do my senior thesis on the study, and in 1974, wrote my senior thesis on it. Friends have pointed out that close to 30 years later, I'm still milking my senior thesis from, <laughs> from, from college. They, they just didn't choose as well as I did. <laughs> and I strongly believe that we cannot forget the inhumanity of the syphilis study, but we cannot let it be the only lens through which we examine the history of African Americans and medicine. One historical event cannot fully explain the long and complicated relationship of African Americans and medicine. In addition, if we use the syphilis study as the primary lens to view the history of African Americans in medicine, we see African Americans only as victims and lose sight of the strength and resilience of the black community and the contributions of African American healthcare providers. History clearly reveals that African Americans have not been helpless victims in the face of oppression, but have developed strategies and institutions to provide care, improve health, advance black healthcare professionals, and to battle medical racism. The history of African Americans in medicine is not only about trauma and scars, but about strength, healing, and achievement. A wider history of African Americans in medicine shows what Manning Marable and Leith Mullins, two prominent African American study scholars, have called voices of resistance, reform, and renewal. This evening, 
we will see that the history of African Americans and medicine is just not about Tuskegee. Our journey will focus on the 20th century. We will see how race and racism have played integral parts in the development of the American healthcare system. We will also see how black Americans have responded to these obstacles. Our journey will begin at the turn of the 20th century, at a time when racial customs and mores severely restricted black access to most hospitals. Hospitals in the North and in the South either denied African Americans admissions or accommodated them almost universally in segregated wards. Often, often placed in undesirable locations such as attics and basements. In Newport News, Virginia, for example, black patients were housed in the city jail until the 1914 establishment of a black hospital, Whitaker Memorial Hospitals. Hospitals worked to maintain the color line and even consciously develop mechanisms to do it efficiently. In a 1907 article in the Transactions of American Hospital Association, a white hospital administrator suggested the following creative scheme to ensure that patients and their personal effects would be segregated. And I quote, the Negro department must always be as far from the white as possible. The equipments in all departments are practically the same, however, the linens, gowns, and every individual of the different departments must be kept as separate as if in different parts of the city. Say, for example, at a glance you can note where each article belongs, as all are marked in large letters. Cream and white blankets for white patients, slate-colored blankets for the colored wards." End quote. During the first half of the 20th century, the color line in medicine was so rigid that even medical emergencies did not bend it. Hospital segregation often led to tragic and at times fatal consequences. The November 1931 death of Juliette Derricott, Dean of Women at Fisk University, vividly demonstrates that hospital segregation had its fatal consequences. It also eliminates the limits of individual actions in the context of institutionalized racism. Ms. Derricott died after she was refused hospital care following an automobile accident in Dalton, Georgia. She received medical treatment from a white physician at the scene and later at his office. According to witnesses, the physician provided good and compassionate care but because of racial discrimination, he could not admit her to a local hospital. Consequently, she was moved to a private home of a black woman who had no medical or nurse training. Apparently, the residence which witnesses described as filthy was where black patients in Dalton, Georgia received their care. Juliet Derricott remained at the private home for several hours and died after she was transferred 50 miles to the nearest black hospital, which, which was in Chattanooga, Tennessee. One friend remarked that her death was due to a hospital system that was, and I quote, rotten and wicked and unspeakably cruel because it would harm any poor, ignorant, wicked, unfortunate victim of an accident if he happened to be Negro, end quote. George White, the father of Walter White, assistant secretary of the NAACP, also died in 1931, and he too suffered the consequences of racial discrimination in medicine. Crossing a street in Atlanta, Mr. White was hit by a car and then taken to Grady City Hospital, where because of his fair skin, he was admitted to the white ward of the hospital. The quote unquote error was discovered when Mr. White's son-in-law showed up at the hospital. Walter White in his autobiography described the scene at the hospital when Mr. White's true racial identity was uncovered. He wrote, 
Do you know who this man is? My brother-in-law was asked. He is my father-in-law. My brother-in-law, whose skin was brown, replied. Have we put a nigger in the white ward, they asked, horrified. Father was snatched from the examination table, lest he contaminate the white air, and taken hurriedly across the street and a driving downpour to the Negro ward. At the time, the black ward at Grady Hospital was the only facility that admitted black patients. Walter White noted that the ward was infested with rats and roaches and that, I quote, dinginess, misery, and poverty pressed so hard on one from every side that even a well person could not avoid feeling a little sick in these surroundings, end quote. George White had worked for the United States Post Office for 43 years and had always paid his taxes on time. But when death had come, his son bitterly remembered. He had been ushered out of life in the mean, meanest circumstances. An implacable color line had decreed for all Negroes, whatever their character or circumstances might be. Racism also adversely affected the careers of African Americans, physicians, and nurses, and underscored the importance of black institutions. Hospitals, nurse training schools, and medical schools frequently barred African Americans. The story of Lillian Atkins Moore clearly illustrates the plight of African American healthcare professionals during the first half of the 20th century. Moore, a senior student at Women's Medical College of Pennsylvania, applied for an internship at the college's hospital in 1923 with apparently unimpeccable, with unimpeachable credentials. She had been a good student, winning the freshman anatomy prize and had been elected secretary of her senior class. Despite her achievements, she was rejected for an internship at the hospital associated with the medical school because she was black. Dr. Jesse Pryor, medical director at the hospital, admitted in a letter to Dr. Moore that race had been the deciding factor in the hospital's action. I had been told that we could not possibly undertake to give you a service here. We're all your good friends. And it is a most unpleasant thing to have to tell you that just because you are colored, we can't arrange to take you comfortably into the hospital. I am quite sure that most of the interns who come to us next year will not be able to give us as good work as you are capable of doing. Dr. Pryor did offer to help Dr. Moore get an appointment at one of the so-called colored hospitals. Moore finally secured a position at Douglas Hospital in Philadelphia. Ironically, in this case, racial discrimination came from an institution that had been founded in response to sexual discrimination in medicine. Dr. Moore's predicament underscores the importance that black hospitals once had to the survival of the black healthcare profession. Racism also threatened the career of Dr. Thomas Payton. When he graduated from the Long Island College of Medicine in the early 1920s, he was the only black person in a class of 100. After graduation, he interned at Mercy Hospital, a black hospital in Philadelphia. After his internship, Dr. Payton returned to New York to open a practice. After several years in successful practice, he decided to specialize in proctology. However, racial discrimination hindered his career aspirations. A New York hospital rejected his application because he was black. The hospital superintendent stated that patients would refuse to be treated by a black physician. Undaunted, Dr. Payton went abroad and studied proctology in Paris and in London. When he returned to the United States, the racial barriers remained. White hospitals refused to provide him with admitting privileges, and specialty societies barred his participation in meetings. The American Proctologic Society rejected his application because he did not meet the requirement of being white. A requirement, Dr. Payton quipped, God made it impossible for me to meet. Despite these obstacles, 
Dr. Payton continued to write scientific articles and practice medicine in the separate black medical world. And his 1950 autobiography, A Quest for Dignity, Dr. Payton lamented, in the field of medicine, I know I could have done much more had racism never been encountered. Racism in medicine also cast a shadow on the career of Dr. Margaret Lawrence. When she arrived in Cornell University in 1932, she was the only black undergraduate on campus and was not allowed to live in the dorms. She supported herself by working as a domestic for white families. Nonetheless, she did well academically and her dream of going to medical school soared, especially after the dean of the medical school complimented her on her performance on the medical school aptitude test. After the examination, the dean called Lawrence into his office. She later recounted this meeting. I recall happily considering medical school, looking forward to my graduation, planning for my parents' arrival, working on renting an apartment for them to stay in. Then she heard the dean's words. He said that she was a very good student and a promising physician, but that the admissions committee had decided not to admit her. You know, he said, without a hint of emotion in his voice, 20 years ago, there was a Negro man admitted to Cornell Medical School, and it didn't work out. He got tuberculosis. Lawrence eventually gained admission in 1936 to Columbia Medical School, and once again, she was the only black student. Lawrence faced another hurdle. She was not allowed to work at Baby's Hospital ostensibly because housing could not be provided for a black woman in the nurses' dorms, where the female interns and medical students were housed. When she got an internship, she got an internship at Harlem Hospital. We should remember that as an African-American woman, racism was not the obstacle in Lawrence's professional path. At Meharry Medical College, a predominantly black medical school, she was the only black woman on the faculty in the early 1940s and encountered blatant sexism. She was excluded from intellectual camaraderie, overburdened with responsibilities, and poorly paid in comparison with her male colleagues. Margaret Lawrence went on to have a very distinguished career as a child psychiatrist. In the loving mem memoir, Bomb and Gilead, Lawrence's daughter, Dr. Sarah Lawrence Lightfoot eloquently demonstrates that trauma and the strength to overcome it were recurrent themes in her mother's professional and personal life. She also made plain that the subcutaneous scars of systemic racism was still with her mother, a woman who had all the markings of success. Fifty years after her rejection, from Cornell Medical School solely because of her race, Margaret Lawrence wept as she told the story to her daughter. Confronted with racism in American medicine, African Americans responded by establishing their own institutions, including medical schools, medical societies, medical journals, nurse training schools, and hospitals. Their exclusion from white professional societies prompted black physicians to found the National Medical Association in 1895 and black nurses to create the National Association of Colored Graduate Nurses in 1908. In 1891, Dr. Daniel Hale Williams, a leading black surgeon, opened Chicago's Provident Hospital, the nation's first black controlled hospital. The racially discriminatory policies of Chicago's nursing schools provided the primary impetus for the establishment of Provident Hospital. After a young black woman, Emma Reynolds, was refused admission to all of Chicago's nursing schools solely because of her race, her brother, a prominent minister, turned to Williams for help. A committee of physicians, ministers, and community leaders tried 
but fail to find a place for Reynolds at one of the city's nursing schools. The experience pro prompted Williams to organize a biracial association of medical and civic leaders to establish an interracial hospital and nurse training school in Chicago. Williams successfully solicit fund, solicited funds and supplies from both black and white citizens. Critical to the success of the endeavor were the activities of black cl club women who worked to raise funds for the association. In June 1891, only five months after the creation of the Hospital Association, a 14-bed hospital opened in this two-story frame house. Unlike most black physicians who practiced at the end of the 20th century, Williams enjoyed wide contact and much prestige in the, black, in the white community. He had graduated from the predominantly white Chicago Medical College in 1883 and had interned at Mercy Hospital, a Catholic hospital. In 1889, he became the first black physician named to the Illinois State Board of Health. Although Williams had access to the white medical world and called for Provident Hospital to be interracial, he understood the plight of the vast majority of African American physicians. After the establishment of Provident Hospital, Williams conducted surgical clinics at Meharry Medical College and at various black hospitals throughout the South. He acknowledged race, that racism, especially in the South, seriously limited the opportunities afforded black nurses and physicians and adversely affected the health care that black patients received. He urged the black community to establish its own hospitals and nurse training schools. In a 1910 address before the Phyllis Wheatley Club of Nashville, Tennessee, Williams contended that, in view of this cruel ostracism affecting so vitally the race, our duty seems plain. Start hospitals and training schools. Let us no longer sit idly in inanely deploring existing conditions. Let us not waste time trying to affect changes or modifications in the institutions unfriendly to us, but rather let us seek to promote the doctrine of helping and stimulating our own race. During the last decade of the 19th century and the first two decades of the 20th century, various segments of the black communities, fraternal organizations, sororities, churches, did indeed take Williams' advice and create hospitals for themselves. At this time, other ethnic groups were doing the same things. They were German hospitals, they were Swedish hospitals, they were Italian hospitals. For, and in, 19, in terms of the black community, in 1995, Dr. Nathan Francis Mosell, who in 1882 became the first black graduate of the University of Pennsylvania, started a, a hospital. Now, Dr. Mo, this is the, uh, the graduation picture from of 1882 from the University of Pennsylvania uh, uh, Medical School. Dr. Moselle is smack dab in the middle there. Now, one of the things about this, I think that he did not want to make sure he was not marginalized and that he was there in, in, the, in, the, in the center of, of the photo. And as I've done some uh, research on Dr. Marcel, I think the fact that he did not allow himself to be marginalized was an indication to his character. He was called stubborn and, and, and very tenacious. Dr. Marcel, when he went to Penn, as I said, which was my alma mater, uh, he was not exactly welcome. When he went to first day of medical school, there was a group of Southern students who start, put the nigger out. And, but he stayed at Penn. In fact, one day when he was walking by the Schuylkill River, which is uh, east of the Penn campus, someone tried to push him in the river, but he ended up graduating with honors from Penn. Um, but even you know, after he graduated from Penn, he also was the first black uh, person to be a member of the Philadelphia County Medical Society. He did an internship in Europe, but despite all these accomplishments, he too could not get hospital admitting privileges in Philadelphia. So he started Frederick Douglass Memorial Hospital and Nurse Training School in 1895. And this was the first building of the hospital. 
And in this building, I think I'd like to show you some of the interior of what this hospital looked like, because I think looking at this three-story building, it's very deceiving in what's in the hospital. There was an operating room, and these pictures are all staged, so uh, um, there's um, uh, Dr. Mosell there in the center. You will notice that there aren't, aren't any gloves. That was a uh, common practice in surgery at that time. This is the female ward of the hospital. The pharmacy. And this is the children's outpatient uh, clinic. And uh, you see that the long tradition of black women and their hats uh, <laughs> demonstrated in this photo. <laughs> There's even a dental clinic in this small hospital that was in South Philadelphia. The establishment of these black hospitals represented in part the institutionalization of Booker T. Washington's philosophy, political philosophy. His then popular accommodationist philosophy emphasized black self-help, racial solidarity, and economic development as more productive strategies for racial advancement than did agitation and the demand for immediate integration. Accordingly, the creation of black hospitals would contribute to racial uplift by improving the health status of black people and by contributing to the development of a black professional class. But it should also be noted that the first two decades of the 20th century also bought, brought the solidification of Jim Crow laws in the South and increased racial tensions in the North. Historians have noted that an emphasis on black self-reliance and the development of black institutions is greatest during periods of black discouragement and increased white oppression. By 1919, approximately 120 black hospitals existed, 75% of them in the South. These facilities were both black controlled and segregated. The segregated facilities were hospitals that were established by the white community to maintain the color line in medicine and to provide at least some health care to African Americans. At the time, the white community realized that germs knew no color line and that it was important to take care of black people, especially that there were black people coming into your homes, taking care of you and your children, so that they felt there was a need to at least provide some care to black patients. However, most of these black hospitals were small, ill-equipped facilities that lacked programs to train black physicians and nurses. Consequently, African-American medical leaders feel that these facilities would be ill-prepared to survive the sweeping changes in scientific medicine, hospital technology, and hospital standardization that were still then taking place. They recognized that the stakes were extraordinarily high for black institutions because in many communities, they provided the only source of care for black patients and the only place where black physicians could, and nurses could practice and receive training. The fear distinction of these institutions prompted the National Medical Association and African American Medical Society and the Ameri National Hospital Association to launch a black hospital reform movement. This reform movement of the 1920s and 30s was launched to improve the status of black hospitals before house cleaning done by outside and possibly unfriendly forces swept away the black hospitals. Their fears were based on bitter experience. In 1900, 10 black medical schools existed. By 1923, only two, Howard and Meharry, existed. <coughs> The National Medical Association and the National Hospital Association engaged in various activities to improve the quality of black hospitals, including providing technical assistance, raising funds, sponsoring professional conferences. They also lobbied major healthcare associations such as the American Medical Association and the American College of Surgeons to take more active role in the development of black hospitals. But for the most part, their, their pleas were received with lukewarm receptions. In 
The activities of these black hospital reformers produced some changes in black hospitals by World War II. One black physician hailed these changes as the Negro hospital renaissance. However, I really think this is too overly optimistic because most of the black hospitals that remained by World War II still remained poorly equipped and ill and, and, uh, and poorly financed. The American Medical Association approved only nine of the 124 black hospitals for internships and only seven for residencies. Moreover, the quality of some approved hospitals was suspect. Representatives of the American Medical Association freely admitted that a number of these hospitals would not have been approved except for the need to supply at least some internship opportunities for black physicians. This attitude reflected the accepted practice of educating and treating black people in separate and not necessarily equal facilities. By World War II, with the advent of the modern civil rights movement, such practices came under increased fire. Medical civil rights activists maintained that a segregated healthcare system je jeopardized the health of African Americans. As Dr. Louis T. Wright, a Harvard medical graduate and chair of the board of the, chair of the, board of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People put it, there is no use saving the Negro from being lynched or educating for sound citizenship if he is to die prematurely as a result of murderous neglect by America's health agencies solely on account of his race or color. The medical civil rights activists charged that the separate but never equal facilities of what they called the black medical ghetto could never adequately meet the health and professional needs of African Americans. After World War II, the campaign to desegregate medical facilities and, uh, gained momentum. In 1948, Edith Irby Jones, the daughter of a sharecropper and a domestic, became the first African American to desegregate a Southern medical school when she entered the University of Arkansas. Although she was admitted to the school, she was not allowed to eat or room or use the bathroom facilities with the other students. Jones's admission was a source of pride for the African American community and it provided enormous support. Her neighbors in Hot Springs, Arkansas, many of them poor working people, passed the hat to help pay for her tuition. The custodial staff at the medical school frequently placed fresh flowers on the table where she was forced to eat, segregated from her classmates. When I was in medical school, the uh, people who worked in the uh, medical school cap uh, hospital cafeteria would give a lot of the black medical students, because we were the first groups there, they would give us free food, they would like, wave us through so that to make sure that, because uh, they really wanted us to uh, make it through, and they knew that some of us were scuffling to get through in terms of financially. Jones graduated in 1952 and became the first black intern at the University of Arkansas. Former Surgeon General Joycelyn Elders has attributed her decision to becoming a physician to meeting Edith Irby Jones. She, when she was in college, she invited Edith Irby Jones to give a talk. And she said when she heard Edith Irby Jones talk about becoming a physician, that's when she, Joycelyn Elders, decided that she too wanted to become a physician. In her career, Dr. Jones continued to be a trailblazer. In 1985, she became the first woman to be president of the National Medical Association. The 1954 Supreme Court decision, Brown versus Topeka Board of Education, is I think perhaps the most well-known civil rights decision. Less well-known are the court cases that dismantled hospital segregation. Simpkins v. Moses H. Cone Memorial Hospital was the pivotal case. On February 12, 1962, Lincoln's birthday, black physicians, dentists, and patients from Greensboro, North Carolina, brought suit to prohibit the racially discriminatory practices at two voluntary hospitals that received close to $3 million under the Hill-Burton Act 
a federal hospital construction program. The hospitals freely admitted that they segregated black patients. And they pointed out that the Hill-Burton legislation did contain an anti-discrimination clause, but hospitals could obtain communities if they maintained separate but equal facilities. The plaintiffs in the Simpsons case challenged the constitutionality of the clause. After the district court ruled against them, the Court of Appeals found in their favor, and the decision stood because the Supreme Court refused to hear the case. The Simpkins decision represented a significant victory in the battle against medical racism. It extended the principles of the Brown decision to hospitals, including those not publicly operated and uh, including those not publicly owned and operated. However, its authority was limited to those hospitals that received money from the Hill-Burton legislation. A 1964 federal court decision, Eaton v. Grobs, broadened the prohibitions against racial discrimination to include voluntary hospitals that did not receive such funds. The 1964 Civil Rights Act supplemented these judicial mandates and prohibited racial discrimination in any programs that received federal assistance. The 1965 passage of the Medicare and Medicaid legislation made most hospitals potential recipients of federal funds and thus obligated them to comply with federal civil rights legislation. In his memoir, Colored People, Henry Louis Gates, Jr., chair of the African American Studies Department at Harvard University, tells the story of an encounter he had with a racist physician in 1964 when he was 14 and had sustained a knee injury during a game of touch football. This story illustrates that access to care involves more than the desegregation of facilities. It also includes how one is treated once one gets through the doors of a facility. After the accident, Gates's mother took him to the local physician in Piedmont, West Virginia for treatment. At the time, Skip Gates himself had aspirations of being a doctor. And while he examined him, the physician quizzed him about his knowledge of medical pioneers. Gates answered all the questions correctly. After the physical examination, the physician asked Gates to walk, but he could not. He fell on the floor in agony. Gates recounts, the doctor shook his head and walked over to my shoulder, my, and my mother, who was waiting in the corridor. Pauline, he said, his voice kindly but amused, there's not a thing wrong with that child. The problem's psychosomatic. Because I know the type. And the thing is, your son's an overachiever. Gates continues. Now there's an interesting history to that term. And what it meant in Piedmont in 1964 wasn't what it meant today, means today. Back then, overachiever designated a sort of pathology the dire consequences of overstraining one's natural capacity. A colored child who thought he could be a doctor, just for instance, was headed for a breakdown. What made my pain abate, Gates says, was my mother's reaction. You have to understand that I'd never heard my mother talk back to a white person before. And doctors, well, doctors were sacred, and their word was scripture. Not this time. After the doctor said his piece, Pauline Gates stared at him for a moment and announced her decision. Get his clothes, pack his bags, we're going to the University Medical Center. That was 60 miles away in Morgantown. Mrs. Gates was the right, decision was the right one. It turned out that her son had dislocated his hip. But I think also in this story, we see what some of individual's acts of resistance can be that people encounter in their everyday life. In the 35 years since the dismantling of segregation, there have been gains in the health of African Americans, but racial disparities in health remain. The black infant mortality is that of the white. African American men have a 40% higher heart disease rate than white men. African American women are 28% more likely to die of breast cancer than white women, although the incidence is less. In 2000, 
more African Americans had AIDS or HIV infection than any other racial or ethnic group in the United States. African Americans now account for 54% of new HIV infections and 47% of new cases. Several factors have been identified as contributing to these disparities, including socioeconomic status, health risk behavior, insurance coverage, health beliefs, and provider bias. These disparities have prompted several initiatives to improve the health status of black Americans. But many of these efforts have come up against the shadow of the Tuskegee syphilis study. In recent years, several articles in both the professional and the popular press have pointed out that the study predisposed many African Americans to distrust medical and public health authorities. These articles argue that the shadow of Tuskegee has created a climate of suspicion that taints the relationship between many African Americans and the medical profession. The Tuskegee study is offered as a reason why few black Americans participate in research trials, why the need for transplant organs by African Americans widely surpasses the supply, and why African Americans often avoid medical treatment. For example, fears that they will be used as guinea pigs like the men in the syphilis study have led some African Americans with AIDS to refuse treatment with protease inhibitors. I think that account that I, I think that accounts that describe the Tuskegee syphilis study as the singular reason or most important factor behind African American distrust of the medical profession are overstated because this mistrust predated the public revelations about the Tuskegee study. Nonetheless, the powerful legacy of Tuskegee endures in part because of the racism disrespect for life, for black life that many African Americans face in their encounters with the medical profession. The continuing shadow cast by the Tuskegee syphilis study on efforts to improve the health status of black Americans provided the impetus for the creation in January of 1996 of the Tuskegee syphilis study which I legacy committee which I chaired. The committee included physicians, ethicists, historians, and black and, and public health officials and we took a lead role in obtaining the presidential apology for the study. In 1973, the federal government began to provide study participants and certain family members, of the, of the, and certain family members with comprehensive medical benefits for the rest of their lives. Also in 1973, the federal government settled a $9 million class action suit which had been filed on behalf of the participants. Nonetheless, in spite of these actions, members of the Legacy Committee strongly believed that the federal government had never adequately expressed its responsibility for the syphilis study, and a presidential apology was needed. Almost 18 months after the creation of the Legacy Committee, President Clinton issued his apology. A few hours before the ceremony, I was fortunate to spend some time with Mr. Herman Shaw, who's here on the far right who at the age of 95 was one of the eight survivors of the study. During my discussion with Mr. Shaw, I told Mr. Shaw that I had a picture of him uh, uh, on his tractor as a reminder of why I do the work that I do. You know that tractor is 56 years old and it's still running, he said to me. <laughs> he went on to talk about how he could not wait to get home to get back on it. It was planting season. The White House ceremony was important, but there was work to be done back on his farm in Macon County. Mr. Shaw and I talked for a good 20 minutes. We talked about his family, his schooling, and his love of farming. He told me that in order to maintain his land and his farm, that for several years, he had to work a second job in a factory. Of course, our conversation turned towards the syphilis study. You know, this was racist, he told me. I said, they only used colored people. You won't get any argument from me on that, I replied. Mr. Shaw, I promise you that as long as I live, I will make sure that people won't forget what happened to you. When I first made this promise to Mr. Shaw, I thought that my obligation was to give the historical facts about the Tuskegee syphilis study. But I've come to realize 
that my responsibility is broader. It is important to remember, as Mr. Shaw said at the White House that day in May, we were treated unfairly and to some extent like guinea pigs. We were not pigs. We were hardworking men, not boys, and citizens of the United States. I think that many times over the past 30 years, as the study has moved from a singular event to a metaphor, that we often forget that it affected individual human beings. Seeing the four survivors who were able to make the trip to Washington and the family representatives of the other four enter the ceremony reminded me that we cannot forget that first and foremost, that this study adv adversely affected proud and dignified American citizens who happened to be born poor and black. Another thing that, as I thought about my promise to Mr. Shaw, that I realized that my job is to bear witness in, in, in terms of the African-American experience, bear witness in terms of my life, bear witness in terms of the lives of, of people who've come in f before me to let people know what the black experience is like in America. As I stated in the beginning of this talk, the Tuskegee syphilis study brought me to the history of medicine. History, however, has become for me not just a professional endeavor, but a source of personal sustenance and affirmation. I too have faced several obstacles in my professional journey, walking to a hospital room with my white coat, stethoscope around my, 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 uh, uh, or my shoulders, and someone still thinking I'm the maid. Thinking that because I'm a black woman in medicine, I'm only there because I'm an affirmative action admit that I don't have the credentials to be there. But the stories of my ancestors has shown me that the history of African Americans in medicine is not just about trauma and scars, but about strength, healing, and achievement. Mr. Shaw certainly would have understood the meaning of the old Negro spiritual, bomb and Gilead. Yes, there is a bomb in Gilead to make the wounded whole. Thank you very much.